Hello and welcome to the Stafford Beer Brain of the Firm reading group. Uh, we are continuing our sojourn through chapter 20 uh, here of General Intellect Unit and listeners. Uh, and uh, this uh, subsequent section is uh, subsection 2, Information Channels Maintain Variety Entrusted to Them on page 358. All right. In the foregrowing section, the distinction between variety and information was clearly drawn. Confusions between the two are especially common when the channels carrying information come under review. People are familiar with the notion that a particular channel can transmit only a finite amount of information in unit time, and that this can be measured. Thanks to the seminal work of Shannon, see references D, who established the mathematical rules under which units of information are transmitted down lines of various uh, characteristics, a communication system can be properly designed in the engineering sense. The tenth theorem, to which I draw special attention, points out that the channel capacity must exceed its notionally adequate bit handling ability in order to resolve ambiguities that may arise in passing the message because of noise in the system. Uh, so we saw this uh, much, much, much earlier uh, in the book come up. Um, but people are also aware that the mathematical theory of communication, concerned as it is with the transmission of bits, does not concern itself with semantic information, which is to say what the bits mean to the recipient. Then often they fail to see the very basic relevance of the 10th theorem to management systems. Some people, having perceived the relevance, begin to contend that the 10th theorem and the law of requisite variety say the same thing. Thus, debates have been heard as to whether Ashby or Shannon has proprietorial priority. The political context of the present discussion provides an opportunity to elucidate this problem, which is by no means academic and the difficulty arises primarily because we seek to distinguish three notions instead of the con convenient two, since any dichotomy slices its relevant universe in half. The three notions are the flow of bits and the flow of variety, both of which are information theoretic notions, and the flow of semantic meaning, which is not. Uh, all right, uh, Jeremy, go ahead. So this is a huge subject in category theory. Um, one of the real pioneers of category theory, William Lawvier, um, devoted a lot to talking about information theoretic uses of category theory. And one of his aphorisms is a functor, trying to explain what a functor is in category theory, said that a functor is a map from, from syntax to semantics which is just a mind-blowing way to look at funk doors in general, you know? Um, and uh, uh, Tay Dene Bradley uh, is another category theorist. She just finished her PhD this year and dropped it on archive as a book that explains her PhD thesis to a layperson and that was her dissertation. Like, her dissertation wasn't just her dissertation. It was a book-length explanation to get you up to speed to understand her dissertation because she felt like it, what she was dropping was so important that she wanted everyone to understand it and had that be her dissertation. Um, and a lot of this is about how do you map syntax to semantics in meaningful ways. Um, and of course, it's very hard to go in the other direction, but you can go in the other direction to map semantics back to syntax. Um, there's something in category theory called uh, adjoints. And in a sense, uh, syntax is left adjoint to semantics. Semantics is right adjoint to syntax. Um, there's a ton and ton and ton and ton of meaning to unpack in that very pithy statement. But all over the margins, I'm writing all this category theory that talks about what Beer is talking about. I think it's really valuable to, 
to if we were ever doing a much deeper dive on this stuff i would go into more detail on this uh right so yeah i i expect many of our listeners will not know what funk doors or ad joints are uh but uh hopefully the uh book length explanation of the subject <laughs> for lay people will help to uh develop that idea uh shane go ahead what do you mean an, an adjoint is just a uh, monoid in the category of an endofunker yeah it's, it's easy um so i mean would it be probably fair to say we're in a much better position on this than they were in beer's time like we've we've got much better conceptual tools um recently and we've got haskell which i guess will help um yeah that's fun um i i don't, I don't think i had anything else to say really i just i guess maybe it, I'm, not, I'm not totally sure he spells it out here or maybe he will later in the section but like yeah that like the difference between uh, information and variety is that like i mean like you could you could blast ones and zeros down a line at an incredible baud rate but there would be very little variation to what you're doing. Like there'd be a lot of information transferred, but no no variation and thus no meaning because what could anyone possibly get from lo looking at a stream of literally just alternating ones and zeros? They could get nothing from us basically. They could get, maybe maybe you could send them a message by the length of the stream, you know, but that's, that's a very low variety stuff. Uh, anyway. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's some ways that that can communicate things, but uh, it's it's pretty limited. Um, uh, so yeah, again, the uh, book length uh, layman's introduction uh, to the subject uh, is by Tay Dene Bradley for listeners who want to check that out. Uh, and a as Jeremy mentioned, it's available on archive.org. Um, okay. So uh, let's uh, continue this uh, look into the um, trichotomy between uh, <laughs> uh, flow of bits, flow of variety, and flow of semantic meaning. Uh, this very point begins the elucidation. One bit of information does not have enough variety the power to discriminate between possible states to distinguish more than two notions. Well, communication theory can deal with that by creating capacity for transmitting two bits. This arrangement has the discriminatory power to deal with four possibilities. Therefore, it can certainly handle three, and with considerable resolving power left over to cope with any ambiguity derived from noise. This will work, in Shannon terms, so long as there is enough time to transmit two bits. It would work in Ashby terms, uh, so that is in variety terms, uh, in half the Shannon time, so long as the bit were replaced by a quartet, the just invented quaternary digit. Uh, so uh, again, uh, obviously we use binary computers, but uh, uh, they did not have quaternary computers in the Soviet Union, but they did have ternary computers. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's kind of fun. Uh, obviously not, not necessary to do any computing, but for some reason they decided that they wanted to have on, off, and then kind of on as their <laughs> options. <laughs> um, uh, this illustrates the exact sense in which the two approaches say the same thing about the information channel. It has to be noted, however, that the identity is of interest only insofar as there is freedom to design either system. If we must use the Morse code, we have only long and short buzzes to play with and cannot add fairly long and fairly short buzzes to reach the variety of the quartet. Therefore, a given message takes longer to transmit, and so on. The practical alternatives proliferate because the rate of transmission can be speeded up, provided that the lines can stand the pace, and that the receiving transducers can decode at equivalent speed. Uh, yeah, I mean, anyone familiar with video encoding will be familiar with this problem. <laughs> uh, the length of silences can be altered too, as they are between buzzes in Morse 
to create a single letter or to distinguish letter groups, which means that under sufficiently careful definition, Morse transmits quartets after all. To sum up so far, which means in terms of a binary distinction between the 10th theorem and requisite variety, Ashby's law is the more general principle when applied to communication channels, since the trade-off between transmission time and single complexity is not implicitly preempted by the choice of a particular base such as the binary digit. But to say so as a criticism of Shannon would be absurd as it would be laughable, since the very source book quoted begins with Shannon's examining various numerical bases for achieving intelligible communication. Obviously, any numerical base could be used, such as the decimal base, or the base E, or 26, considered as the number of alphabetic characters. The base 2 has many advantages, see my cybernetics and management, reference B, 5. But none of this, although it fosters broader thinking in the domain of technical transmission, has yet faced the problem of semantic communication at all. Uh, okay, uh, we'll continue on. Um, the burgeoning crisis in the ABC intersect, which uh, the listeners will remember is this uh, intersect where the variety, uh, sorry, the, the oscillation in A uh, can start to overwhelm B and C, and this is the problem we're dealing with here. Um, the burgeoning crisis in the ABC intersect will proliferate variety in country X, and party A knows it. It therefore formulates a plan, the name of which is O, pronounced zero which it intends to put into action in country X if certain conditions, which it lumps together under the heading of the criterion of stability, are negated. Plan zero, we must observe, has no hope of success unless it can proliferate variety at the same rate as the crisis. This statement is true independently of channel capacities, as was seen in one, subsection one. Suppose now that the crisis deepens. Remotely, in country A, a finger hovers over a button which controls a transmission line, sounding a continuous buzz. If the button is pressed, that buzz will change to silence. Plan zero goes into operation. The communication system is logically binary and handles only one bit of information. In practical terms, it had better incorporate redundancy. For example, the button might have to be pressed 10 times at regular intervals. This would convey 10 bits of information, instead of the necessary one bit, which is enough channel capacity to discriminate a variety of 1,024 rather than two. Then a mistake used, uh, sorry, then a mistake due to noise in the system, what was that again? Did you say zero? Has a thousand fold protection. But this kind of discussion still concerns variety inside the wiring of the channel and not the semantic variety of the message. The semantic variety transmitted by one bit, or for protection by the 10th theorem, 10 bits, is the entire variety of plan zero. This could specify a million states. It could specify a billion. How much variety it releases in country A to deal with a crisis is determined entirely by the availability of the designers of Plan Zero to foresee the complexity of the crisis in advance. It has nothing whatever to do with the channel capacity of the link, whether Shannon protected or not, in the sense of the mathematical theory of communication, so long as that one bit, the transition from one, the buzz, to two, plan zero can be conveyed. This example, simplification though it may be, uh, draws the further distinction that we needed. It also reminds us to realize through those last italics that the channels vary, uh, sorry, the last italics are can be, con can be conveyed. That the channel's very existence is under threat in any crisis. Wires may be cut, emissaries captured, radio signals jammed. The complete cybernetician, therefore, 
will not hesitate to draw on the genius of Ashby as well as Shannon, and will certainly be found designing redundancy into the anastomotic reticulum between channels, as well as into the transmission lines within channels. A review of the Chilean code system to which reference was made just now makes, all, makes clear all these distinctions. Uh, okay, so we'll look into this. So I believe this Chilean code system is the one that Beer set up prior to the coup and which failed, uh, like, in practical terms, if not in, like, sort of code-making terms, uh, cryptological terms. Uh, okay, so each code enabled the use of a variety attenuated channel. Since a, say, five elements or five state element in the code could specify a, say, 50 state element in the crisis. This is what encoding means. B. The channel capacity, channel uh, in the Shannon sense, of any one transmission line handled the variety, Ashby sense, of the code as a product of a time epoch and an alphabet of symbols, such as one bit each half second equals one quartet each second. Or, in this case, one discrete and discrete letter, uh, yeah, one discrete and discrete letter. I believe these are like two senses of discrete or something like that. There's two different spellings here of discrete. It's um, pretty strange. Yeah. I don't know if um, this is like an archaic English thing that doesn't maybe. exist anymore, but it's, it's very strange. Um, so uh, discrete crete as in C-R-E-T-E -E versus C-R-E-E-T. Uh, yes. Letter selected a message from an adaptive range of possible alternatives. The channel capacity, Shannon sense, of the entire reticulum could not be calculated because it was A, anastomotic by structure, and B, semantic by the inference it entailed, inferences it entailed. Thus, if this channel capacity were treated as calculable, then in crisis it would not necessarily work, because the self-organizing demands of the reticulum may in principle exceed any finite limit. The adequacy of the entire reticulum as generating a regulatory model, Ashby sense, could be calculated in terms of the variety encoding code onto the sensory plate balanced against the variety that could be decoded from it via the motor plate solely in terms of homeostatic equilibrium within the burgeoning crisis when the loop was closed. Since any one channel leading to or from the reticulum is invariably under threat, both as to its physical existence and as to the integrity of its code, other channels and other codes need to be used, and in this case there were three of each. The redundancy built into the system presupposed that the three channels intersected at crucial nodes of decision. As far as the exemplification of these arguments through the Chilean codes is concerned, the dangers and difficulties seem to have been equally spread between the three channels. The first failure, put down earlier to psychological traumata, occurred in the A, B domains above. Uh, so the variety attenuation of the channel uh, and the channel capacity uh, handling the variety. The second channel worked, but would shortly have failed in the D domain so D domain is uh, the variety that the sensory plate can encode versus the uh, variety that can be decoded from the motor plate. I believe, uh, uh, okay, so I, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, as to the discrete question, uh, Jake has... Uh, helpfully looked up this question. Uh, so discrete in the C-R-E-T-E -E sense is individually separate and distinct, and discrete is the social sense, uh, careful and circumspect in one's speech or actions. So is both discrete, like separate and distinct, and also careful and circumspect is what Beer's talking to uh, about here. 
so as for to this D point, um, yes, the D point. I believe Beer said earlier in this chapter that uh, the second uh, the second uh, cipher, the second coded message system, uh, failed because the the messages became uh, like undecodable. It, 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 so I think this is like the variety of the um, sensory plate versus the motor plate and the equilibrium between them uh, is the problem in, in what Beer's describing, right? Is that like, yeah, we can, like we still have a reliable encoder, but the problem is that it's like, we can't actually understand what's being sent anymore. Uh, because the equilibrium is out of out of place. Um, the third success derived, I think, by accident from an open ended coding system, which operated very well in the crucial C domain. Uh, so C is, again, uh, channel capacity of the entire reticulum. Uh, oh, I see. It's right. So it succeeded because it was uh, overcoming this problem of the channel capacity not being calculable uh, because it's astomot an astomotic and it's semantic. Um, so, you know, this open-ended system was able to successfully overcome that problem uh, even though it eventually collapsed under its own proliferated complexity. The overriding failure, mine, was in the E and F domains. This aspect is well worth cybernetic rumination. Uh, and again, E to F, E and F. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the redundancy uh, that is necessary because um, the reticulum is under threat physically and in terms of code integrity. And then F... Uh, you know, uh, the intersection of the system at, at crucial nodes of decision. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead, Jake. Yeah, there's a lot here that I'm like, not quite sure if I fully understood. But um, yeah, I don't know, I, I guess just like, is he is he saying that there's like, you know, whatever this whatever the code is that would enact the plan, you know, requires you have to f be able to communicate what's happening in order to figure out which plan is enacted. I mean, not in the example he gives where there's just like the plan zero and it's just the one thing or the other, but like in the real world or in like a more real example. And I guess is is it. I don't know. I guess I'm just like having trouble, like kind of quite wrapping my head around the like example or not the example, but like the concept. Like, I think I kind of get it, but it's, I don't know how to put it into words. So maybe I don't get it, you know? So I guess I'm just like, did anyone? Yeah, I'd say this like, is probably a case of not getting it uh, in terms of like, you know, you get one of those like really difficult concepts in lecture. And you're like, uh, okay, okay, and you're not along with it. And then the test comes along, and you're like, I've got no idea what this means. <laughs> so uh, I think a lot of that problem could be put down to beer, uh, like providing his examples like 20 pages earlier than uh, right. the explanation of the examples. <laughs> um, right. Uh, is, yeah, is, go ahead. Sorry, is he, so is he saying that, like, you know, whatever channel used to communicate that, like, this crisis is happening and here are the details of the crisis mm -hmm. that would allow you to get through it as a system? Like, the channels for that require some higher level of, like, information transmission capabilities. Like, you know, I, I guess in my mind, like, isn't, Theoretically, like, wouldn't just like you pick up the phone and you call the person or people who could like enact the plan and and sort of explain like here's the details as we know them. That's like too high variety 
but too low like information i guess and he's he's saying like you need kind of a better way of filtering out the variety into the actual relevant information or maybe i'm using them well yeah, mixing up information and noise and variety here but i mean we're kind of dealing with like a, a cryptographic problem here right because if someone had just in chile called up beer and uh had all the time in the world to explain what was happening uh then the the the, the sender and the receiver are able to essentially uh balance uh the variety and balance the anastomotic reticulum right uh the problem is that even though the uh information processing given enough time right because you know if you're going to co communicate something over phone you need quite a bit of time to explain it uh even though that's that's perfectly adequate the problem is that like they're under a fascist dictatorship and uh, there's a good chance their phones would be tapped, right? Um, and so the, the security of the operation would be completely blown. Uh, so this is why you needed some kind of, you know, cryptographic solution to this problem. Uh, and Beer came up with these three different solutions to the problem, uh, you know, all of which failed, but for different reasons. And here he's trying to explain specifically in the space between information theory, variety theory, and semantic theory, what went wrong and, and use those examples to um, explain uh, what he means by those terms and how they relate to each other. Uh, Jeremy, go ahead. So I really feel like we need to tease this stuff out for it to be useful, considering that, let's say there was a viable communist movement in the United States, when there's been even a barely viable communist movement in the United States before, there have been red scares that completely smashed it to bits. And um, and that's probable that that would happen again. And so looking at Beer, Beer, his mission didn't end when Allende was assassinated. He launched a years-long campaign to get a lot of his colleagues out of torture chambers, out of prisons, and free finding them academic positions in various places in the USA and in Europe. And he kept at that process as long as he possibly could at a time where if you look at what Chile was like in late 73, early 74, no one knew if people were alive or dead. A lot of people were herded up into stadiums many of whom were shot, many of whom were disappeared. And it took many years to figure out what happened, even to the ones who were killed the very first day. So Beer is talking about the systems he put in place on the assumption that something bad might happen. But he says throughout the book that no one ever dreamed that the clampdown would be as brutal as Pinochet's clampdown actually was. They thought they would lose power and that a center-right government would take over and they'd be out of power for a while. So they didn't really create the kind of systems that would have been necessary to survive Pinochet and still remain effective. And by singling out ENF, he is saying that the systems that he put in place that tap into an anastomotic reticulum <clears throat> were designed to depend on interacting with each other, and that just wasn't possible um, because things were smashed into more bits than anyone would have dreamed would have happened. Um, and also the redundancy was not sufficient to get the messages through. So I think 
teasing this out for future use is going to be really important because what he's saying is on the assumption that there are ghouls as ghoulish as the CIA and as ghoulish as Pinochet, how do you build structures that survive that level of being smashed? And so I, I don't, I think this language is really hard to tease through, but I think it's important to do so because he's kind of pointing the finger at how you survive if the clampdown gets this nasty. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's it's not like purely a uh, cryptographic problem because it's also just about like maintaining enough. Uh, infrastructure and also like members to make this effective um yeah uh okay so let's go to uh Shane and then Jake I feel like this this sort of problem of um keeping these like covert yet available communication lines like like um like the definitions that Jake dug up, right, that like discrete in the first sense being that like you select messages that are or message atoms that are individually separate and distinct, but that in the other sense of discrete where they are circumspect, right, they're, they're, they're covert and hidden, which is kind of wonderful because it means you have to select messages that have meaning to the recipient, but that don't have meaning, that don't, don't look obvious to anybody looking. Um, I, I, this probably gets so much worse today, right? Where we're like you're organizing on f fucking Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and or your your stuff's going through Google servers and stuff. It's like yeah, the cops have a backdoor into all that stuff, you know. And you combine that with atomization, and like I don't know, like I, I can I can imagine it being a bit easier to pull this kind of stuff off if you had like you know natural connections with people. Um, rather than relying on Facebook groups to somehow be, um, you know, to carry the information and also not be legible to the fucking NSA that has a backdoor into the Facebook system anyway or whatever. This this is very hard now. Um, the other thing that you're, it, this is this is dense, uh, tricky stuff. But one of the things that kind of I, I get the impression that he's in some sense saying as well that for any given communication channel and for signals on that channel. You have a, both, a, both a kind of like Shannon signal and an Ashby signal, and they're not the same thing. Um, and that the re law of requisite variety and of like the mathematical theory of communication sort of apply to both, but not quite in the same way. And it, it's, it's, it's a mistake to mix them up. So that like the, the plan zero example is one where the plan itself and the action of the plan is actually very high variety, but it's triggered by a very low variety signal. And so a naive sort of Shannon-oriented interpretation would be like, there is nowhere near enough variety in that channel to carry out this action. It's like, no, no, it's not the point. It's the semantics of what's sent. The, the nod and the wink, right, is a one-bit signal, but it, it, it's very meaningful when it's received by the right people. Um, so the, 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 Ashby, the Ashby signal is more rich than the Shannon signal. Um, and I guess you can have the reverse as well, where there's a very rich Shannon signal that has basically no Ashby signal in it. Like what I was saying with the repeated sequence of ones and zeros, or, um, you know, you pick up a copy of The Economist or whatever, and it's like, ooh, you know, Syrian hardliners gaining influence. And it's like, you know, it's paragraph after paragraph of stuff that says nothing. There's no, no semantic meaning there. Um, I, yeah, I, I kind of don't know. I, I agree with with Jeremy that this would need to be teased apart a lot more to figure out what the implications really are, especially in an age where, on the surface, we have access to a lot of communications technologies, and yet we're so atomized from each other that like the natural communication is sort of broken down, and we're more reliant on these comms technologies, and they're more they're less suited to secrecy than ever before, unless you count you know, what, like Telegram and Signal or whatever, the, the handful of applications that do this kind of end-to-end -end encryption well. And, like, nobody's going to use GPG signatures on email, so shrug, you know. Um, tricky stuff. I mean, there's always steganography, you know? Yeah, true. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think 
we're in a situation where steganography, if people cared, could be more powerful than other tools because people are constantly sending memes and cat videos to each other. You know, you set up a Facebook group that's like wonderful, amazing cat videos, all of which have steganographic signals in them. No one's going to find them. I don't think Facebook is set up to find steganographic messages. Not that I've tipped my hand mm -hmm. or anything. No, that's a good. That's a really great point, though. Like the, the steg steganography, where it's like the um, the Shannon signal and the Ashby signal diverge completely, and it's it's not obvious at all that there's an Ashby signal in there. But there's a there's a lot of Shannon signal, but you can't tell what it is, you know. Uh, okay, let's go to uh, Jake and then Brett. Yeah, those are there's a lot of good points. Um, you know, I think I think ultimately, like when we when we're talking about this kind of like secrecy it probably has to just be like <laughs> done offline you know like if we really don't want them to see the plans and know what they are it's just like write it down on a piece of paper and don't give it to anybody and it's like more secure than broadcasting on facebook whatever you use to, to you know hide it um but i do think you know I, I had a lot of thoughts with the stuff that you guys were saying i think you know some of it is like we need like redundancy in the number of people who like know what signals to transmit and also how to decode them, you know, in the broader sense of like how to communicate some, this information that it happens in a crisis situation and what the information could lead to, you know? Um, I mean, so that's just like one thing. And it's like a matter of just like training and building relations between more people so that more people, you know, can kind of can be the receiver or the sender of this situation of, of this signal. Um, Another is like, yeah, I mean, the, the signal can be low information, but like proliferate variety, I guess. And, and maybe I'm like, I'm just thinking of like, you know, like some dead man switch type thing where like, you know, if you don't send this very simple signal at a regular interval, it releases, you know, some cache of documents or whatever. And that increases the variety like a huge amount by, by introducing all this information into the system. Um, that's another thing. I, I think, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure we, I think in the left right now, in, in the, you know, communist movement as exists in the U.S., we don't really have a good understanding of what is information and what is noise, you know? And so we use these tools like Signal or Telegram or whatever. Like I'm on a bunch of, ton of Signal threads, you know, and ton of Signal groups that are, ostensibly important because they're made up of people who are, have this thing in common, you know, but no one knows quite what to send on them. And it's, it, it either ends up being very little used or, you know, used, used a lot in moments of crisis. And actually I'm, you know, thinking about this now, of like, you know, during the uprisings, when they started here um, in my org, we, we created a bunch of signal threads to kind of, coordinate protests and coordinate people on the ground. And so one of the things we did to reduce the kind of noise was to, you know, segment off, like, here is a comms uh, signal chat, here is a, a recon signal chat, and then here's like protesters signal chat, you know, so like the comms people would be listening to like the police scanners, the recon people would be like, on the ground with like bikes or whatever, like mobile. And then the protests were just like anyone who was like protesting, you know, so like people could be saying a ton of stuff in the protest chat, but then, oh yeah, see you, see you, Jeremy. But then in the, you know, few chats where it was more about coordinating that there wasn't as much noise. And so it was easier to kind of communicate the information, whereas the protest chat had like people asking questions and people saying stuff about something they thought they saw. And it was, you know, it was very kind of, chaotic, but just like, you know, having multiple, I guess, channels for different types of information signals is helpful, you know, it is, but only like, you got to know what those are and like explicitly say them because otherwise, right. It's, it's not as useful. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just, uh, yeah, I think, I think the task is more of like, not so much how do we create these channels? Cause, cause like, they exist. The technology now exists. Yeah, we need to be we need to be redundant, and not just in the 
the the tools that we're using, but also the people that are trained to use the tools, I think is the real thing. It's like getting the people, getting as many people as possible, understanding how they're used, how to decode and encode the signals, right? So that, you know, um, it's not just incumbent on one person. And I, and I think of this also in the context of like, even somewhat non-crisis time of like, yeah, single points of failure are bad. And even just in regular organizing of like, here's the one person that knows how to do this, who knows how to do all the things that we require to like keep the organization running. Oh, they had a baby. Oh, they can't do this anymore. Fuck. What do we do? You know, it's like building that redundancy into the system is like super necessary, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the channel separation, it's basically like exactly the the example that beer gives in designing freedom for like using departments in a department store as a strategy of variety attenuation. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely effective. Um, I really do wonder, you know, like, I wonder to what extent, like there's anything that we could do that is not just going to be like exposed to, um, surveillance because there's so much uh, capacity there like in terms of you know capturing messages at the point of origin or quantum computers used for decryption or you know surveillance being like literally everywhere like Amazon even has it in her homes Google has it in her homes etc etc uh, like the, 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 the panoptic power of the state is so enormous that like, I mean, you know, it's, it's like the panoptic power of the state is enormous at the same time, like literally like every left movement in history we can think of was compromised by the police. <laughs> so, like, I don't know how much that actually changes things, uh, considering that, like, maintaining, like, OPSEC has never been something that the left has been able to do. Like, ever. Uh, and to some extent... The, the information gathering, the panoptic power of the state is subject to the same problem that Beer identifies in Designing Freedom with computers, right? Is that it's giving way too much uh, information, way too much variety to the wrong people and not being able to understand it. So, like, there is a certain degree of just, like, overload that works in our favor. But, of course... You know, if they figure out, well, this is the group that's leading things, then they can just zero in on that and actually understand what's going on. Uh, okay, let's go to Brett. And to that point, and to Jeremy's point, I mean, there was a story, there was a Twitter thread going around a couple of weeks ago about how the DHS surveilled all the, pro the Portland protesters, and all they got was a giant, they spent millions of dollars, and all they got was a giant pile of who was canceling who on Twitter. They don't know how to deal with it either, right? Uh, so there's a certain way, and we can sort of joke about that, but about how left just in is actually practice. Um, but, but it also means that we can sort of walk around in, in broad daylight and, and there, there, there could be a point where they just don't understand what's going on uh, because they don't really get it. Uh, because, because they're not used to dealing with the type of organization that we're building because they're used to dealing with top-down organizations. Um, and there's, I mean, you could imagine them trying to, to attack a different way, but I think they have the same variety problem that we have. Uh, just, a different, just a different angle on it. Yes, I mean, they spend, like, billions upon billions upon billions uh, trying to attenuate this variety, trying to understand it. Um, uh, Shane, go ahead. Um, yes, I, I want to I follow up on, on that stuff, but I, one thing um, I noticed is that the Plan Zero in these examples reminds me a lot of, like, the Bakunin's kind of like secret conspiracy sort of thing, like his kind of notion that 
the, the hidden conspiracy thing where like all the anarchists would just get themselves into the right place at the right time. And when the moment was right, they would just all give each other the nod. And then, then that would be the moment and they would, they would like just spring into action. That's the sort of, that's very like the plan zero thing. Right. And, um, I think with the Bakunin thing, there's a certain degree of magical thinking going on there, right? That like, there's just going to be this magic moment. that's going to be sublime. Right. And like, everything's going to go, go, smooth from there because it's this is the moment right like big t big m uh, but it's, it's it's a thing that's apparently triggered by a very low variety signal and it's because these people have like prepared ahead of time they already know what it, what's on each other's mind and all it takes is a nod to to set it going now on the on the, on the matter of like yeah or i think maybe brett was getting in the right direction there with like kind of organizing in the open that i think the kind of like like small scale clandestine basically like terror cell model of of organizing it has has some kind of strengths in that it's like you know it can be resilient and stuff but it's also like very few people a tiny number of people so very little redundancy and um all it takes is to knock out one or two people and the whole thing goes right that's it's extremely weak and fragile and because you then have to organize in secret, that means you have to be airtight all the time. And if you slip up once, it's all it's all done for. Um, and that it's a desperate situation. I think it re- it reflects the kind of desperation of the kind of mindset that leads you to think that crawling around in the dark and blowing up power substations is the way to get a proletarian revolution or whatever. It's that very kind of like again maybe the Bakuninite sort of magical thinking sort of thing like that. But what I'm wondering though is like. If you have mass, you don't need to be secretive, right? So, I mean, like, if if, if you think about the George Floyd uprisings, if people were planning before that to burn down a police station, they would have to be extremely secretive. They'd have to be fucking airtight, like really tier one operator level of fucking secrecy and then planning. But once once you had mass support, you could go and just burn down the fucking police station in broad daylight with hundreds of people. And nobody's going to stop you, right? There's mass is always the thing we're going for here, right? Like it's, we're talking about a mass socialist movement, a mass revolution. It can't really be something that depends on a tiny hidden network of anarcho terror cells. That that can't be a proletarian revolution. And maybe we should take the hint and take the hint from beer here and like orient ourselves more towards kind of the kind of mass redundant organizing that is resilient to to interference and kind of allows you it gives you the like fig leaf cover of organizing in the open where you can say hey no i'm i'm not some fucking like anarchist terrorist person i'm just, i'm just i'm in labor you know I'm, I'm in the labor party what are you talking about you know um and I, I don't know there's there's a lot to be said for for mass and for like not needing as much secrecy with the admission that yeah there's going to need to be you know, covert channels through which to speak in private. But it feels like leaning on that is too much because it, it means like, because the CIA know that's the case, right? They know you need to communicate in secret and they know they can break that secrecy. So that's what they go for, right? It's like, how do you take down a giraffe? You go for its legs. It's, it couldn't be more obvious, right? Those, those are the delicate bits that it absolutely needs to stand up. And you just like, you don't go for its head, go for its legs, right? And I feel like the, 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 the ultra secrecy, the kind of like clandestine, um, vanguard underground sort of thing is very like that. It's very like that with those kind of fragile, spindly little legs that are just so obvious, right? And like the CIA aren't fools. They look at it and go, oh yeah, this is the way to take these people down. Uh, yeah, I mean, the most successful anarchist conspiracy, terrorist conspiracy uh, in history was again, you know, the SR Combat Org. Mm. And they were led by a paid police informant. <laughs> so, it was compromised from the start. It couldn't. It couldn't have possibly ever worked, right? Well, no. I mean, it it worked. Right. Like it did. It did actually destabilize yeah. the Romanov government considerably mm. and contribute to the revolution. But it did all of it while the leader was on the police payroll. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Boast made this uh, great uh, comment, who needs solidarity? We have serendipity. But, like, literally, in that case, they did have serendipity. 
<laughs> they had like someone who was just a complete opportunist who was on, uh, you know, the police payroll and was just surrounded by a bunch of people who wanted to like blow shit up and kill people. And it all just kind of came together and like, did those people end up forming a successful anarchist government after the fact? But fuck no, of course they didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they did achieve what anarchist terrorism is supposed to achieve uh, <laughs> just by blind luck of like, oh yeah, this like, you know, the CIA director has decided to support an anarchist combat mm -hmm. org. Like, like, no, I mean, this is never going to happen. We can't rely on that. That's ridiculous. Uh, Absolutely not, right? Um, oh, there was just one, one more thing as well that, that just came to mind on this, like, desperation kind of front as well. Um, I think we should always keep in mind that what Beer is describing here is an a case of extreme desperation. And in fact, the whole, the whole Chilean revolution was pushing a boulder up a hill from the start. That it... it these these sort of modes of failure are already quite a bit down, quite a ways down the slope. The fault has already begun quite a bit before this point. Um, so I'm, I'm not certain of how how much of a linchpin this 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 stuff specifically is. Or I guess once once you get past past the point where catastrophe is obvious, there's all these other failures, and it's not clear that they're like singularly responsible for the thing. Because like from the beginning. The, the revolution just didn't have the kind of mass militant support it would have really required to carry it over the line. So maybe, maybe that's the, the Ur failure that kind of makes all the rest of the failures kind of lesser. I don't know. Um, well, I think it's... it's have, have volume and have a lot of support, have mass support, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I think it's a very different problem from the ABC problem that he's discussing in this chapter, which is mm -hmm. one that is, you know, relevant all the time. Yeah. Whereas this kind of secret messages problem, uh, yeah, I mean, it's important, mm -hmm. but uh, not to the same degree. I guess uh, maybe a, a very compact way of putting it would be, is there any amount of um, cryptographic encoding that will make up for a lack of, la a lack of mass support? And I don't think there is. No, of course not. That's why, you know, like internet security obsessed libertarians are fucking mm. useless <laughs> like that's why they like try to like they're like oh yeah like you know they all imagine they're in the movie hackers and mm. like they can just engineer their way around the problem blah 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 uh but they all eventually get to the point of like oh yeah actually this is really useless because we don't have any kind of organization uh, we don't even know what we're doing. We just kind oh. of have a suspicion of the state and we want to maintain security. Uh, it's like, well, I guess we can at least get jobs with this or like, you know, mm -hmm. become security consultants or design another better system. Like it, it, it it's, uh -huh. yeah, like this, the, the, the crypto achieves like nothing by itself other than giving the state more better ways to fuck with us. Um, uh, okay, uh, Jake, go ahead, and then I think we'll try to get a little bit further in the wrap. Yeah, I'll keep I'll keep it short. It's just something that uh, Shane said that reminded me, or made me think of this, of like, you know, you, you when you mentioned the like, the anarchists or the people in the protests, and then you know, just something happens that sets everybody off, you know, or or maybe it's a direct like specific signal from like. A person or from a group of leaders, maybe probably less likely in an anarchist situation. But um, you know, just thinking of like the idea of class consciousness as like imbuing people with the like decoders to know like, hey, this situation is happening. That means it's time to like start the plan of like implementing a revolution. You know, like whatever that means, whatever that looks like. But just the idea of like giving people the the like signal in de decoding capacity to know like hey like the time is right to like start to implement some of this stuff you know like the idea of of not you know you can like preemptively you can do it like and you the conditions aren't right and you fail but you do it and conditions are right and apparently you know nominally you would succeed right you know it hasn't happened yet but you know that that kind of uh just that idea of like uh class consciousness as a sort of shorthand for uh having the ability to decode the signals of the contradictions in capitalism and, and that the conditions are right for 
change to come about. I don't know. Right. I mean, that is a certain, like, you know, developing a system for for the proletariat, right, uh, kind of idea, uh, looking out at the world and seeing, ah, there's an opportunity here. Um, totally. Okay. Uh, let's, let's get a little bit further. Um, yes. The criterion at F was taken all too uncritically as fulfilled. Uh, so again, F is the, uh, this idea that like we have three channels, they're going to be redundant. And if, you know, one of them fails, the other ones will help to clarify what's going on. Uh, the people concerned were very close friends, and this seemed in advance to mean that their variety would be multiplicative. If each agreed with the other two, that is to say that the semantic meaning and the variety explosion of each of the three messages in different codes was the same, then the protection of the motor action's informational integrity and operational validity would be huge. It would be especially large if each of the three channels had each of the three codes. That would be good cybernetics, but bad tactics. Obviously, it is very dangerous to the individual and to any operational plans of the group to have more detailed knowledge than she or he needs to fulfill a single role in a crisis that involves arms insurrection. It's very interesting. This is the first time in the entire book that Beer has used multiple pronouns to describe a person in the abstract. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I guess like when it comes to like underground guerrilla actions, <laughs> it's OK to have two genders, whereas in any any kind of managerial or abstract technical sense, you just have one. Uh, it's very, very strange. Uh, it, I wonder if this is also an artifact of like it be this this section being written later than the others. But I don't think that's really what's going on here. Uh, it's just. Anyway, it's a, that's very, very weird. Um, uh, yes, okay. So therefore, I made each code specific to one channel and did not even divulge to any one of the three that there were two others. This led to F-type failure and was therefore a mistake of the metasystemic proportions. It is a mistake that I would repeat for the reason given. But seeking, meanwhile, alternative means of circumventing the difficulty to which it gave rise in F. So, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, both says the management dude bro versus the gender ambivalent insurrectionary. Um, excellent. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, yeah, again, the problem is like, oh, yeah, we'll just give everyone all the codes. And it's like, no, I mean, that's not going to work. Uh, we need a different solution. Um the anecdote about the Chilean codes is recorded not merely for the sake of completeness, nor to embroider a tragic event with trivial flourishes. If people could only see, when locked in conflict, that the distinctions drawn here apply to them and to their situation, detente would mean more than airport embraces. As to societary conflict in the post-industrial age, uh, yeah, so... Um, I don't know if detente here ref refers to Cold War detente and, and like the exchange of political prisoners uh, is is the airport embraces. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, as to societary conflict in the post-industrial age, there are always at least three parties, management, workers and government to a dispute which makes the customary binary logic inappropriate. And there is a whole range of models and codes in continuous use, which it is not within anyone's interest or perhaps competence to acknowledge. Can it be, then, that political naivete is a characteristic of politics itself rather than of commentators or those who intervene, much as economic naivete is characteristic of economics itself? We cannot, of course, advert to military naivete in the same terms, because this brand of childishness leaves all the protagonists dead. Um, that point about political naivete being inherent to politics, I think, is what I was trying to get at 
in the last session when we were talking about, uh, you know, always overestimating the unity of the enemy side, uh, you know, and beer sort of giving that kind of problem a uh, variety uh, theoretic basis here. Uh, but again, he says like, well, be that as it may, you still got to have your shit together in the military field because otherwise you're going to get killed. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. In developing figure 30 for, excuse me, uh, like actually let's, let's leave it there uh, because we'll be getting into figure 48 and 49 in the next section. And that's going to be uh, a more intricate discussion. Uh, so we'll we won't finish section two uh, today, but we'll we'll carry it on next time, um, and then uh, maybe get into section three. Uh, so any final thoughts uh, before we wrap? Uh, Jake, go ahead. Yeah, just like uh, kind of briefly on that, like the F type failure is I think an interesting interesting one of just the idea of like you know the F failure being the redundancy built into the system presupposed that the three channels intersected the crucial nodes of decision. I mean, that to me, you know, and this is my interpretation of it, I guess, of just like the codes being in the hands of the people who have the information that's relevant to enacting the plan that needs to be enacted. And also like, yeah, so that whoever is able to say like, yep, it's a crisis. We need to do X, Y, and Z knows what, X, Y, and Z is not just like on the plan level, but like here's the relevant information um, and that they like see that the problem is happening. You know, I think I think he's saying, right, that the the fact that it was an F type failure is because like the people who he entrusted with the codes are like weren't aware of the crisis, the scope of the crisis in the time needed to like know that it was happening severely enough. Like like I mean, and part of it, obviously, like he says, is built is the fact that he didn't build into it such a level of like react like conception of the crisis as this potentially such a devastating thing but um yeah i guess just that that thing of like you know to bring it back to like the redundancy and having the people there is like you want it redundant so that wherever the crisis happens you have a better chance of of having someone in a decisive position to be able to react to it and react to it in a way that like informs the rest of the organization or the higher up parts that can enact a broader plan than just the local area, you know, of like knowing that this is a problem that's happening and on what things it's acting on, I guess. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm sort of feel like I'm rambling a little bit, so I'll stop. But well, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of slippage in what beer describes here because, um, you know, he kind of talks about a, uh, like, military insurrection as being relevant to this question, but it's not actually what the system he developed was for. Uh, it was just to maintain a line of communication between Chile and the outside world for the, for the leftists inside of Chile. Um, and as to the question of redundancy, it wasn't so much that the um, the members of this group being caught flat footed was what caused the system to fail. Like each of the different approaches, each of the three approaches failed for different reasons. But the fact that they failed interacted with like this F problem of his overall design, which cut out the redundancy and made the system useless. So, like, yeah, there were particular reasons why each one of them failed, but in the end, the overall design was flawed because it didn't have enough redundancy to cope with those failures. Like, one of the people, he's, he just alludes to, like, psychological problems. Like, maybe they got too scared, maybe they, like, you know, went into, like, dissociation from reality, like, who knows, right? Like, it's, they just broke under the pressure somehow. And it's like, okay, that's a failure, right? And in itself, that, does, that isn't like a catastrophic failure 
of the overall design. But the fact that each of them failed for various reasons and then there were only three points uh, made it a uh, flawed design. Um, uh, yeah, Shane, go ahead. Yeah, definitely, right? I think, um, I mean, is, is there a thing here to suggest that, like, yeah, the, 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 the people weren't even aware that there were other channels, so there couldn't have been redundancy. I, I guess there's, there's a couple of failure modes that are possible there. Um, either you have all this kind of stuff set up, but the people don't actually know to compare notes with each other, mm -hmm. um, or they do, but they're not at the nexus of decision. Or, you know, they are at the nexus of decision, but there's no possibility of taking effective decision. And then maybe finally that if, if, if the sort of workers movement just doesn't have rifles on the ground anyway, then what, what decision could really make a difference, right? Like, um, and so there's, well, there's, there's I mean, a couple of different ways that could go wrong with this, like, these channels arriving at the nexus of decision. Um, maybe the latter one is actually more of a motor problem rather than a decision problem, but... Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the the kind of things that would matter are the kind of things Jeremy was talking about, right? Like, mm -hmm. who is alive or dead? Who has yeah, been sure. captured? Uh, this These are the kinds of things that this system was set up to convey. Because, yeah. like, the fascist government, to whatever degree possible, wanted to render the, the country a black box to the sympathizers of the left within the country. And the system was there to get around that problem, mm -hmm. right? The system was there to be like, oh, you know, uh, so-and-so has been captured. We need to, like, start a, uh, like, uh, international, like, sympathy campaign to help get them out of prison. Mm -hmm. uh, like, or, you know, so-and-so could escape... Like we need to set up a way for them to be received and and take it out of the country. Uh, so like those are the sorts of things that it was dealing with more so than those three people masterminding a insurrection against Pinochet. Yeah, sure, sure. I guess I was more thinking like kind of brainstorming like I don't know future scenarios or, or the kind of things kind of things you'd be kind of concerned with for uh, for future organizing, right? That like. Yes. Um, that it, 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 I mean, when he says, like, have this stuff converge at the nexus of decision or at, like, relevant nexuses of decision, that's, that's all very important. There's a couple of ways that that can go wrong. It cannot converge. It can converge, but the, the nexus itself doesn't know to compare the notes. It can do mm -hmm. all of that, but then still not have the capacity to decide and mm -hmm. then still have all of that, but then not have the capacity to act. And, and sure. it just means, like, maybe going back to, like, the... Um, ultra secret of cryptography sort of thing you have the, I don't know some underground like um, you know uh, I don't know like Tradcath terrorist network that wants to like roll back to Vatican 1 or something but it's six guys and they have no power like yeah cool mm -hmm. like getting those messages through to the through to the the, 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 the the inner council of the little secret group or whatever but like they don't there's no capacity to decide or act on anything and like what, what's the what's the nexus of decision for modern day Catholicism. It's inside the Vatican. And unless you're there, <laughs> it's uh, not going to make much difference. Yeah. Or it's like at the level of the archbishopric or some mm -hmm. kind of, you know, sub organization of the church, sure. but it's not six guys in a basement. Um, mm -hmm. I guess uh, maybe the, for, for the left, the kind of thing, maybe the, the, the sort of warning I'm trying to get to there is to not mistake our organizing activity for like necessarily being the, computation of the proletarian will or something like that it's where six guys in a basement is not a kind of instantiation of the world spirit you know it's uh it's just six guys in a basement uh yeah sure um mm -hmm. you know sometimes it is right sometimes. like sometimes it is uh uh mm -hmm. there the uh the history of leftist organizing is replete <laughs> with a bunch of grad students in a basement mm -hmm. deciding they're going to wage a war against the state and then right, sure. uh, going on to become like guerrilla leaders and stuff like it's this, this kind of thing does happen. Uh, but sometimes it's just six guys in a basement. I get, I get <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, okay. 
Uh, yeah, as long as they're publishing a magazine from Switzerland, it is, in <laughs> fact, an instantiation of the world spirit. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, well, uh, I mean, okay, like, I think we're going to talk more about this problem next time. Uh, I don't think that, you know, these questions about insurrectionary organizing and operational security are super relatable to our current context right now mm -hmm. uh, but the, as Beer said there are still like important questions to consider consider so we will we will go through this uh, uh, you know as uh, has been going on in the chat there's a uh, the point's been made that uh, we have the next two weeks uh, are sort of uh, vacations. Uh, for uh, this uh, this day, this recording date. So uh, the next session, uh, taking up uh, subsection two, uh, will be in 2021. Uh, so yeah, have a good couple weeks off, everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we made it through the year. <laughs> Lots of, uh, I mean, yeah, who knows? We've got two weeks left. Anything could happen. Yeah. The revenge of 2020, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, we might we might make it to 2021. If you receive the next podcast episode, know that we survived. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, and uh, enjoy enjoy your time off, uh, such as before, it is. Before we wrap, I wanted to point out just the absolutely brutal landmine that like beer planted for you, where he's like the name of which is O pronounced zero it's just like, it was almost like it was fucking designed to be misread on air it's absolutely hilarious yeah i i think this has to be like a primitive typography problem mm. where like he couldn't actually get the printers to print a zero with sufficient mm -hmm. fidelity to be read as zero and not yeah and not be read as o or it wasn't in the uh type like that doesn't make sense it must have been in the typeset but it just mm -hmm. it just probably like the the original print quality was probably a lot lower so it wouldn't have been clear that it was a zero or an o uh so you know he's doing some uh he's doing a little bit of encoding there to to cope with mm -hmm. uh the low information uh bandwidth of the uh there you go, of the original yeah. uh, the original the print the semantic meaning is conveyed even though it's not really yes. present in the in the um the shannon signal yeah 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 you just mm -hmm. increase the length of the description a bit and you can mm -hmm. you can do it uh okay all right everybody uh Thanks, everyone. take care wonderful. yeah it's uh, you know as people are saying 2021 is 2020 part two mm -hmm. uh that is that is part of the weird uh i think the weird out of time sense of these holidays right now we right get, we that, get sequels like fifa games you know what i mean yeah yeah or like just like the fact that like nobody can actually meet up for the holidays mm. so it just it's just like this weird gray zone of like you're on vacation but also like stay inside and mm -hmm. don't meet anyone uh resume your activities as before so i don't know uh there will be i guess there will be fireworks in some places maybe in mm -hmm. wuhan in wuhan they will do 2021 yeah, new year celebrations and we will all watch it on television uh <laughs> so just as just as Wuhan was ahead of us at the end of last year, so too are they ahead of us at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Well, take all care, right. everybody. Take care. Bye. 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 Good night, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.